So, hello to everyone. My name is Jari Pekka Kaleva. I'm managing director of the European Games Developer Federation. And I'm here to talk about what next. How do you upcoming changes in the European consumer and uh, copyright law are going to impact on your business? And this is will be perhaps one of the most boring presentation during the whole conference. But it's kind of nice to know when you are dancing on the minefield what kind of mines you might be hitting uh, while you are jumping around. So let's talk first about EGDF. EGDF represents uh, 19 European trade associations from 19 different European countries across Europe from north to south, from east to west. Altogether, we represent about 2,500 uh, game developer studios that employ about uh, 40,000 people. And all in all, there are, we estimate there to be about 5,000 game developer studios and publishers in Europe that employ up close to 80,000 people. But today, I'm here to talk about uh, changes in the European consumer law, and let's start with the new rights for employees coming because of the new copyright directive that is currently still being implemented. It was supposed to be fully implemented all member states in end of June, but then COVID happened, uh, changes uh, in the system emerged, and it's still a process ongoing in a number of European countries. Some countries like Germany have already regulation in place, but unfortunately, a number of other countries it's going to take until, let's say, end of this year, beginning of next year, when the new rules will be finally implemented and you will know what kind of your local system will be. Poland, unfortunately, is one of the countries where there has been delays. So, what to get ready for? The first thing is to find a way, for example, a license or permit to authorize players to stream themselves while playing your games. And why you have to do this? Well, when the new regulation, or, sorry, new directive was negotiated, of course there was a music industry saying that you too want these platforms to take more action to take down all the music that is unauthorized in their platform. Then there was film industry telling that we need to take these clips down from YouTube that are really, really being used without our permission. Then there was book industry telling that you have to remove all the uh, content where people are reading aloud books because without permission. Then there was uh, photographs, uh, people taking photographs, telling to the commission that look, there are photographs used in YouTube without our permission and this content should be taken down. So of course they had to do something and this was the most lobbied part and one of the most difficult uh, articles in the whole new directive. But in the end, the platforms are now forced to make best efforts to obtain an authorization so that uh, they can ensure the unavailability of specific works and act to disable access to or remove uh, any work that has been notified to be removed. And challenge for the games industry, of course, is that we have step by step moved away from this kind of paper download business model to uh, closer to this games as a service or free to play business models where you are actually trying to encourage people to stream your gameplay. You are trying to secure that you are reach those important uh, games industry, social media influencers, and they are going to play your game. And of course, it will be rather annoying if they are going to see a notification from the platform that your stream will be taken down because they haven't obtained an authorization. The challenge at the moment is that we don't yet know how YouTube and Twitch will be implementing these new rules because uh, national rules are not ready yet. But for example, the game, German Games Industry Association game has collected a list of permissions and licenses on their website so that uh, these platforms can say, look, we have looked onto the website and there is a permission uh, from these companies to you stream their games. So at least as a game developer studio, you might be interested now to make somewhere on your website visible that please, uh, if someone asks, we are allowing streaming uh, or through permission or license or whatever works in your own local regulatory framework. 
on, on the other hand, if you now are making, let's say, some kind of narrative storytelling games and you want to take those annoying uh, let's play videos down, well, you have new means for that. You can just notify platforms that I don't want to see my play game streamed uh, through your platform uh, because I want to keep the story as a surprise for its player. Just be prepared some angry feedback from some of the players if you are doing that. So the second thing to get ready for is to answer, uh, get ready to answer questions about new regulatory risks uh, for investors and publishers. So one of the two most controversial and scariest new rules are so-called contract adjustment mechanisms. Basically, it comes from the fact that um, there are some, for example, in France, authors, great artistic creators are really important. The policymakers want to defend them. And if they have accidentally sold, let's say, a song for a movie for a really cheap price, and then the movie is a big hit. Of course, uh, the regulators felt that it should, they should have a right to renegotiate a better contract, because obviously this uh, is a bit unfair. But of course, it sounds quite scary that any artist would be able to say, look, I didn't receive enough money from originally with the original contract, I should be now allowed to renegotiate the contract. But the fact is, these kind of clauses have existed for years, for example, in Finland or Germany, and they really, really haven't been a big challenge for the industry. And we are not really expecting them to be. But it's something worth checking uh, from your own regulation, how it's going to work, and be able to explain to a publisher or investor, especially outside Europe, who are asking, like, what kind of business risks will be involved if I invest in your company, and artists or authors are able to renegotiate the contracts. Then the second bit controversial part is right for revocation. So if you are getting an IP, let's say, from the book industry, and you are not do using it for anything, of course the policymakers felt that, okay, it's not really fair for the uh, writer, if the book IP is not used, people are just standing on it, if, especially if it's uh, uh, this kind of exclusive deal. So then the author or performer would be able to revoke the whole license agreement and license the, the uh, IP for someone else who might actually use it for something. And uh, this, of course, might be a bit of risk, but of course, if you're using the IP, then um, they will not have that right. But these are the two articles where we have already seen that some of the investors and publishers have started to ask some questions from game developers. And how does this work in your country? So it might be something to for checking out. Then the actual part that is going to cause most challenges for the game developer studios is going to be the part where we are facing some new transparency obligations. So you should be getting ready to identify who is making artistic contributions in your game and which of them are authors under the copyright law and build, build a way to report required information to them. And where this comes from is this. So if you have this kind of contract adjustment mechanism where you are able to renegotiate contracts, if uh, you are um, feeling that the deal was a bit unfair, of course you need to have an access to the financial information on how much money is generated by your artistic contribution. And this is going to be a bit tricky. So authors will get the right to receive information on a regular basis, at least once a year, on how their works have been exploited. For example, modes of exploitation or revenues generated and any remuneration to. And this, uh, for the games industry perspective, first question, of course, who is going to be an author who is you have to report this kind of information to? And this is a tricky question. Some member states will use the, uh, in their regulation, will introduce in their new copyright law that this doesn't apply when a contribution of the author or performer is not significant. 
So in games industry conference, in games industry context, you have an intern who has made, let's say, one pixel tree in your game, and you have hundreds of people working, so it's clearly insignificant, and doesn't really make a difference. So perhaps you can exclude that one. On the end, end of the spectrum, might have, might have a creative director, someone who is really working with artistic vision, pushing the everything together, combining everything. So clearly, she or he will have this kind of major artistic impact on your game. So they might be included to be authors, but you have to draw the line somewhere. And uh, the good news is that coders are not included, because of course this is coming from the French way of thinking about authors and coding is not art for them, which of course sounds a bit silly for the games industry perspective. But yeah, so when you have identified who is this kind of author who has right to have access to this kind of information, then the second question is, what? how are you going to report this information? And for that, uh, of course, if you have any kind of stock options uh, or any kind of uh, bonus system or something like this present, then you can say that, okay, I'm reporting this information anyway to my employees. So there is no extra reporting needed on that side. And um, well, some say that even a salary itself, like if you are working in a small company, everyone knows how the company is doing, so there is no need for extra reporting. When this comes as challenge is actually the part when people leave the company. Because these rights are something that people will always carry with them. And so you have to do this reporting also for the ex-employees who have made significant artistic contributions, at least in some countries. And also the question is like, how does this work with the freelancers? Let's say you get a significant part of the music, narration, artist, like game art from a freelancer, how are you going to keep them reported? So clearly there will be some updates into HR system that doesn't need it. And at least you have to track who has made any kind of contributions to your game. Hopefully, Unity Engine or someone like that will implement some kind of new tools for this. But in the meanwhile, this is definitely something to worth keeping in mind while updating the systems. So, that was the copyright part. Then we are going to have a directive on contracts for the supply of the digital content. And as this is uh, being entering into force a bit later, it is well in track and many of the countries are now pushing it forward and it looks like more or less all around Europe there will be new rules in place in the beginning of next year. So what should you do? First of all, get ready to update your terms and conditions. Unless uh, you have specifically mentioned in your um, uh, terms and conditions that you are going to make significant modifications to your game. And this kind of significant modification on your game can as a surprise for our players. They will have a right to get their money back. This is especially important in uh, free-to-play games, where, of course, the game balance is constantly changed and so on. So just adding this one sentence about uh, significant modifications that, that are going to uh, take place in your game will perhaps save some of the big troubles in the future. Especially if there is a big group of uh, uh, angry gamers, some of them really pushing for, for your company, then they might use this kind of uh, clauses to cause a significant amount of administrative burden for you. And also, in, in, from the consumer perspective, of course, if you are playing a game, investing a lot in a game with a certain kind of balance in it, and then it suddenly changes to something completely different, you might argue from the consumer perspective that it would be nice to be notified beforehand that something like this might happen. Um, the second issue is to tr start to control the hype. So if you're in your company, you have some kind of, um, let's say, really extrovert creative director who is going to join conferences like this, Tell uh, how in your game there will be 
huge sandbox of, with an area of hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers and colder unicorns flying on the sky, then that's the promise for the consumer in the future. And when a player downloads the game and snaps on C, golden unicorns on the sky and the actual area in the sandbox is only on a few tens of kilometers, then they will have a right to get money back unless you have uh, corrected that information that was given in the conferences. So secure that any hype you are creating is in line with an actual end product or at least if there are some changes, you are, will somehow inform the players that these changes are now taking place and it doesn't uh, look like you will get golden unicorns in the game anymore. Uh, then you should identify the content a player might want to get back. This is actually rather easy because according to new rules, uh, of course, you should make available to consumer any content other than personal data that is, of course, covered by the General Data Protection Regulation, which, which was provided or created by consumer when using the digital service, except when it has no utility outside the context of the digital con uh, context of the digital content or digital service. So basically, most of the content in the games will be out of the uh, scope of this requirement. But of course, again there will be some players at some point contacting the player support and asking access to some information. And then you should be able to have some kind of reply, for example, saying that, look, uh, this information you are requesting from the game is only meaningful inside the game, so you don't have right to access to information. In practice, this might, uh, parts where the consumer might be allowed to have access to information might be like profile pictures for avatars or something like that. And this all comes from the services like where you are storing photographs in the internet or something like that. And of course, the policymakers might just secure that all of us have access to download that kind of content. We have uploaded some kind of photograph services. But now, this covers also games industry. Ah, and it's also useful for you to map and use your own new rights. Because according to new rules, the trader can pursue remedies from a person's liable uh, in the previous links of the value chain of transactions. So let's say you are running an esports event and because of one of the service providers, it goes down, it doesn't work, and then the players want their money back. You would be allowed to ask remedies from the organizer of that event. On, but unfortunately, it's only if it's implemented in the national regulations. So check your own uh, upcoming changes in the copyright law. It might provide some benefits for you as well as a company and security against the third party service providers when something goes wrong. Then get ready to go open source if you are an amateur game developer. Because uh, of course, this kind of rules would be a quite a big burden for any um, amateur developers. So you are able to avoid uh, this kind of uh, consumer protection requirements if you are publishing your game as under open source license. Then these new rules will not apply to you. Of course, there's still GDPR that you have to follow that might be a bit of a challenge, but at least this is the way to avoid this kind of regulatory burden. So that was extremely quick overview on two regulatory frameworks that are entering the force just now. Are there any questions from the audience or online or on site at the moment? Yeah, please go ahead. Should I, do you have a microphone somewhere? Oh, that's coming. Okay, in case of the um, remuneration for artists yeah. later on, is it possible for the company to um, just have in the contract like we expect to have I don't know a revenue of 100 million um, dollars and we are telling you this now and so um, you knowing that agree that you are still doing this for just 100 zloty and you like revoke your right to in this remuneration or uh, can no such like Statements be in the contract. 
uh, if I remember correctly, that is specifically not allowed that you are giving away your that right. I, and that was the idea of the regulation that to secure that they will, uh, these authors will always have this right. But I think the best way on this side, uh, yeah, if you really want to be on the safe side, just uh, have some kind of bonus system or stock options present in your company, and then for sure they will always those things will scale up when uh, the game is successful. So of course it's clear that then it's uh, going to be a fair remuneration. It's most likely only in the cases as you, like you described, where you only make this kind of single payment and then suddenly the game is a huge hit where this might actually be implemented. But as I said, this has existed in Germany and Finland for years already, and I have, at least I haven't heard any of cases there might be having one case in Germany, but really like it has been really minimal. So I don't really expect this to be a huge, huge risk, actually. The more bigger challenge comes from the reporting obligations, because that's a part where you really, really have to do something at the moment and build some kind of new reporting system that is really bureaucratic and burden something to do. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, Kachmala Mikhailo is a games technical artist. Some companies has uh, some companies are changing their balance, but they do not allow uh, do not an announce this. And this is the part of mechanics that they are earning money, like uh, changing balance and selling new new content for players. Uh, the question is. Would players uh, like fight with this by themselves, or there will be some kind of organization that will track it? So, uh, but the bad news on that side is that there actually might be some organizations because part of this big consumer, new default consumer package, is the fact that there will be this kind of cross border uh, rights for consumer organizations to make uh, this kind of injunctions to local market course against companies. And uh, in more, some European countries, where I come from Finland, we have a strong consumer protection authority that is operating. But for example, in Germany, they have really strong consumer associations that will have a right to take action on behalf of the players where they expect that something uh, strange is going on. But in the end, all that you have to do is change your terms and conditions and say, look, there will be changes in the game balance. So then it should be like something that players are expecting all the time to happen because from the consumer law perspective, we all, as we know, have read carefully through the terms and conditions and really understand what is written in them. But that's also the reason why they should be also written in a very plain and simple language so that everyone reading them understands that, look, there will be changes. And it's not secure that the game balance will be always the same. And it's really, as long, I would say, in the consumer law, as long as it's not a surprise for a player that something is going to change, more open and transparent you are, first of all, less risk from the consumer laws of your side you have, but also I would say more happier the players will be on the long run because they feel that there is not this, not this kind of sudden surprises happening that will impact their gameplay. Any other questions? If not, well, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any further questions. I'm uh, happy to continue the discussions on other EU policy topics as well as needed. Thank you so much.